Proudly we hail. From New York City, where the American stage begins, here is another program with a cast of outstanding players. Public service time has been made available by this station for your Army and your Air Force to bring you this story, as proudly we hail the Women's Army Corps. The story is entitled Operation Rescue, a true story of WAC Sergeant Margaret Millen, who served with the American forces in Europe. Our first act curtain will rise in just a moment, but first... Here's a most important message for young women listening to this radio program. If you are between the ages of 18 and 34 and qualify, you can prove that this is a woman's world, too. How? By enlisting in the WAC. Women in the Air Force. By joining right now when you're needed most and when the opportunities for advancement are greatest, you will be serving your country well and yourself too. You will have opportunities for some of the finest technical training in the world. Training which will serve you well should you elect to return to civilian life. But most of all, you will have the inner satisfaction of knowing that you are serving your country when the need is urgent. Do your part in keeping America strong. Visit your local United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station and enlist in the WAF. Women in the Air Force. Do it now. And now your Army and your Air Force present the proudly we hail production, Operation Rescue. Frankfurt, Germany, in the fall of the year 1946. The place, switchboard room in headquarters building of the United States Army. The time, a little before dawn. Frankfurt military post. Oh, no, sir, I'm sorry. Nothing's come in. No word at all. Yes, sir, as soon as I hear anything. Yes, sir. Marge, mm -hmm. you've got to get some sleep. You can't keep on like this. No one can. You must get some sleep. Oh, I'm all right, Betty. You haven't been to bed in almost 36 hours, and you've got nothing to eat. There's coffee and sandwiches. Marge, look, I'll tell Captain uh, Farnham... Betty, that... get me some coffee. But, Marge... Betty, please, I'm too tired to argue with you two. Oh, just get me a cup of coffee, please, huh? Sure. Sure, Marge, coffee. Oh, uh, and Betty? Yeah? Uh, one sugar, no cream. One sugar, no cream. No, Helen, nothing so far. They said on the radio that they'd spotted something at beach near the French border. Stop listening to rumors. What does Marge say? Coffee, one sugar, no cream. Mm, I don't get it. That's what she said. Coffee, one sugar, no cream. She wants some. Right. Well, I'll go with you. If you like. Won't do any good, though. When Marge gets some news, she'll let us know. All of us. Yeah. If she gets some news. <laughs> Coffee, one sugar, no cream. You liked it that way at home, too, remember? Remember back across how many switchboards and transports and trains? Remember your home? Remember? I suppose no one likes to leave home, especially a home like mine in Hazelton. Hazelton, 
That's in Pennsylvania. My mom and my dad had both come from good-sized families. <laughs> Ours was pretty big, too. I had five brothers, four that were grown up like me, and then there was little Bobby. Bobby was too young to know what was going on when America entered the Second World War. I had two sisters, too, Betty and Anna Marie. They were both younger than me. The war to them was just big headlines in the newspapers. The war to them was things they wanted and things they couldn't have, but the war to me was something very serious. And it was serious to two of my brothers, August and Joe. On December 7th, 1941, they enlisted immediately in the United States Army. I wanted so badly to be of some use, too. And so I thought at the time that the very best place for me was in an airplane factory. Oh, it was a huge place. Blocks and blocks long, and you became a part of the whir and the rumble. Part of the movement of the giant machines. You were a card which was punched in the morning and then at quitting time. You were Margaret Millen on that card, but of course, everyone calls you Marge. You know, Marge, sometimes I wish I was doing something more than working in a defense plant. Sometimes I wish... <laughs> yes, Lou. Oh, never mind. Say, Marge, should I have a date with George tonight? He wants I should have a date with him, but I don't really know him. I mean, real good, that is. What do you think about him, Miss? Hey, George? Uh -huh. Seems all right. A girl can't be too choosy. Liz had a big heart, but she had a one-track mind, too, and that was about men. I couldn't help thinking, though, about the way she said, A girl can't be too choosy. I thought about it in a much different way. I thought about it all that day, and it kept running through my mind as I rode the bus into New York on Saturday afternoon to do some shopping. A girl can't be too choosy. I wanted to be very choosy. I wanted to make the best choice in deciding how to help my country during the war. I wanted to make a choice which would help me, too, in the years ahead, a choice which meant a solid and fine career. <laughs> The lights bubbled gaily over and around Times Square that evening. I stood watching them, knowing I had a decision to make. Working at the airplane factory wasn't enough. I wanted to do more. I had to do more. And the choice was up to me. Oh, excuse me, miss, but uh, uh, could you tell me how I get to Radio City Music Hall? Mm, I I'm sorry, what did you say? Oh, well, excuse me, miss. Oh, no, no, wait, please. It it's just that I didn't hear what you asked me. Well, I, uh, I have a ticket for the Radio City Music Hall. I don't know where it is. Well, you haven't far to go, Corporal. Just six or seven streets. You can't miss it. I sure hope not. This is my first trip to New York. Some big town. Big like nothing I've ever seen before. <laughs> yes, it is a big town. Well, thank you, miss. I'm supposed to be there at seven. And then someone stepped between us and someone else, and then he was gone. <laughs> Yes, he was gone. But something stayed behind, something in the tone of his voice, something in the way he carried himself, in the pride with which he wore his uniform. And suddenly I knew the answer to my problem. Suddenly I knew the choice I wanted to make. It was all suddenly so very clear. <laughs> We need girls like you very badly, Miss Millen. I'm glad you've made this choice. Your papers will be processed immediately. Oh, thank you very much. Basic training. <laughs> no explanation needed, I'm sure. Oh, it was hard work. Routine work. Reveille at 6.30, calisthenics and drill. The thrill of your first letter from home. Fatigues and your date dress. And then... 
It was only a matter of weeks until my address was changed from Fort Oglethorpe to Gunter Field, and finally, Frankfurt, Germany. <laughs> I'm glad to have someone here with your experience, Corporal Millen. You'll be chief operator of headquarters switchboard, a very important assignment, and one which I'm sure you'll enjoy. And now about your billets. Uh, the whack billets are two blocks down the street. Uh, you pass the key at Frankfurt, Germany, 1946. The remnants of the war were everywhere, and they were very ugly remnants. The torn and twisted buildings, rubble piled high along the streets, the streets where the crack troops marched, the invincible men, the iron machine, the goose step and heads held stiffly erect, the dream that marched into a nightmare of hell. Frankfurt, Germany, 1946. The railroad station, the Carlton Hotel, deluxe accommodations with one wall torn out. And everywhere the stench of decay, the gray shadow of hunger. Hunger painted across the faces of the children. Hunger looking out of their eyes. Hunger holding out its hand for a bit of chocolate. But all of this was a part of our assignment too. Part of the words, Army of Occupation, European Command. <laughs> The days were routine. The work was difficult, but it was exciting, too. Calls coming in from Paris, from London and America. Calls routed to Berlin, to Vienna, to Munich and Heidelberg. Once just names in a geography book. Now names spread across a telephone switchboard before me. Your movements became automatic. Your voice, a non-committal mechanism. Yes, General Blair. I'm completing your call no, now. No, Sergeant, I'm sorry. No personal calls through the switchboard. You should know the regulations. Yes, London, you're coming through. There is interference on the Frankfurt line, Frankfurt Military Post. Yes? Just a moment, please. I'll connect you. I'll have to transfer your call to the post exchange for that information. The officer in charge is Major William A. Bentley. Hour I'm sure after that... hour, calls coming in, calls going out. A five-minute break was as welcome as a school recess. You'd step outside for a breather. Cigarette, cup of coffee. If it weren't the middle of November, I'd say this was the longest day of the year. <laughs> Cigarette. Oh, coffee for me. No, sugar, no cream. I've had so much of this stuff today. If I get near an open flame, I may percolate. <laughs> you never had it so good. Are you referring to the coffee? Mmm. Mm, it's not bad. Good coffee is something I really enjoy. What time are you off duty tonight? I'm not. How's that again? I'm not off duty. I'm taking Helen's shift. And what's with Miss Glamour? She pair a cuticle too close or something? <laughs> you wouldn't want me to stand in the way of young love, now, would you? Marge, look. You can be a nice person. And you can also be too nice a person, and people walk all over you. How many times have you taken that gal's duty so far this morning? I don't mind, really, I don't. I like Bill. <laughs> and it's for him, too. Bill is in Italy on furlough. A Bill is landing at Rhineland tonight. He got on a special flight, a C-47 coming from Pisa. Is it okay if I take Helen's shift now? Okay, <laughs> you win. Oh, I wish you could have seen Helen's face when she got the call from Bill. Talk about a bright sun after a thunderstorm. Uh, you know, I guess maybe I was as happy as she was. We just stood there and grinned at each other like a couple of foolish kids. Marge. Helen, we were just talking about... Uh, Betty. Marge. Wait a minute, Helen, what is it? Marge. Oh, God. oh. But Betty, get some water. Get some water in the sure, hall. Right away, now, Helen, Helen, honey, now, now you're all right. Here, just try to sit up a little. Now there, that's better. Is it? I've seen the room, Marge. The radio was on. They said. Now, just take it easy for a minute, Here's Helen. Some water, Marge. Should I call the captain? I'm all right. Really, I... Oh, sure, sure you are. Now, here, try a little of this, huh? Oh. Thank you. I'm... I'm sorry I was so silly. It's just... Now, a... you uh, said something about the radio. Yes, it was a news report. The plane is missing. 
A C-47. But, Helen, you mustn't jump to conclusions. Well, you know there's more than one C-47 over this here. This one took off this morning from Pisa, Italy. Uh, oh, my. Oh, my. Bill's on that plane. Bill's on that plane! <laughs> You are listening to the Proudly We Hail production of Operation Rescue. We'll return to our story in just a moment. You know, times have certainly changed. Why, just a few short years ago, women were completely left out of this man's world. But today, in more and more instances, women are proving that they can assume the role of skilled technicians in positions once thought of as solely for men. Now, a case in point is aviation. Today, in our rapidly expanding Air Force, women are taking their places alongside men as cartographers, control tower operators, cryptographers, and dispatchers. Now, these are but a few of the vital services now being performed by the women in the Air Force. If you are between the ages of 18 and 34 and can qualify, Visit your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station today. Ask about the WAF, Women in the Air Force. They need you now. You are listening to Proudly We Hail, and now we present the second act of Operation Rescue. <laughs> No report of the missing plane. Two days passed. Three. The entire zone was alerted, soldiers and civilians alike. Everywhere searching parties spread out through woodland tracks, in the mountain districts, through the wide Bavarian farmlands. AFN, the American Forces Network, was on the air hour after hour, keeping us informed on the latest details of the air tragedy. Early this morning, constabulary and Air Force vehicles rolled into the town of Beach in southern France to check on the report that the wreckage of the plane had been sighted. But after hours of fruitless search, military leaders were forced to give up when a heavy blizzard started. The same weather has now grounded all searching aircraft. As yet, there is no indication that... Well, no news is good news, Helen. I don't want to listen. Try a little of this hot soup. Oh, I can't eat, Marge. Now, Helen, look, listen to me. You've got to pull yourself together. You're just making things harder than they are. Maybe if you came back to work, maybe oh. that would keep your mind off things a little. And here everyone say, has there been a report of the plane? Hasn't headquarters heard anything at all? Oh, my. Marge, I can't. I just can't. Oh, okay, Helen, I understand. <laughs> but please try to eat a little. You'll feel better. I'll leave this tray here for you. See what you can do, huh? <laughs> Frankly, Corporal Millen, I don't know where we can get any experienced help. We've screened all the files in this district. None have had any switchboard training at all. <sighs> Betty Thomas has been on duty for almost ten hours without relief. Several of the other girls are starting their second shift, too. I've tried to reach Timmy Brady and Joan Nagel. They're on leave in Garmish. The blizzard, though, has cut off all communication in that district. Well, we'll get along. It's of the utmost importance that the switchboard be kept operating smoothly till some news comes in concerning the missing plane. I'll do my very best, Captain Fine. I'm sure you will, Corporal. Tell me, how is Helen? She's sleeping now. She's certainly taken this whole thing very much to heart. The poor kid just can't think of anything else. Well, let me know if I can do anything. Anything at all. I will. And thank you, Captain Fine. Oh, by the way, Corporal... How long have you been on duty now? Don't worry about me, Captain Farnham. I, I'm fine, just fine. Well, if I find anyone at all who can relieve you, I'll send them right in. Thank you, Captain. Uh, Marge? Oh, yes, Captain Farnham? Thank you, too, Marge. Thank you very much. <laughs> Frankfurt Military Post... Oh, no, sir, I'm sorry. Nothing's come in at all, sir. No word. Uh, yes, sir, as soon as I hear anything. Y yes, sir. 
Marge, you've got to get some sleep. You can't keep on like this. No one can. You've got to get some sleep. I'm all right, Betty. You haven't been to bed in almost 36 hours, and you've had nothing to eat. Just a sandwich or two and coffee. Marge, look, I'll tell Captain Betty, Farnham... Betty, get me some coffee. But, Marge... Betty, please, I'm too tired to argue with you two. Just get me a cup of coffee, huh? Sugar, no cream. Time became something I'd read about in books. Time was something I'd known a long time ago when I was packing my kid brothers off to school. Time was a clock I punched at an aircraft factory in New Jersey. Time was reveille and miss call and retreat and taps. But not the switchboard stretching to my right and left. Not those flashing lights. Not the constant... Frankfurt Military Post. Frankfurt Military Post. Frankfurt Military Post. Frankfurt Military Post. Today is the fifth day in the search for the missing C-47, and the area in which the plane is believed to be has been narrowed down considerably. The job has been long and grueling, men working impossible hours under impossible conditions, but still not discouraged. Last night, four fires were sighted. Approximately 40 miles away, an oil smudge fire was sighted and wreckage seen, or so the report was worded. But it was just another rumor, another false report. At Ryan Betty, Mays, you a special want to hear any more of this? No, I think it makes the waiting easier help. not to listen at all. Mm -hmm. I do too. Food. I took the radio out of Helen's room. Oh, if only there was some definite news, some hope, anything. Frightening, isn't it? What time is it now? A little after 11. I don't think we can expect any rush of calls till morning. I suppose you turn in. I'd rather stay here with you. No, I can handle this by myself. I don't need any help. I'd rather stay. Betty, can't you understand? I have to stay here. It's like those men out there looking for that plane. They have a job, and they're sticking to it. I'm chief operator. It's my job. Marge, the switchboard's my job, too. Mm -hmm, but it's my responsibility. Okay. Then let me go down to the mess hall and get you some... Betty, oh. what... It's all right. I, I just feel a little bit tired. Look, you're going to bed and right now, or else I'm going to call Captain Farnham. Now start marching. I knew I had to keep awake. The night stretched on an endless corridor before me. Strange the things that keep running through your mind when you're alone. Little bits of your life, snatches of conversation. Brief glimpses of people and places you'd forgotten so very long ago. A girl can't be too choosy these days. I had to keep awake, had to keep watching the switchboard. It sure is some town. Big like nothing I've ever seen before. And as chief operator, it is your duty, your duty, your duty, your duty, your duty. Frankfurt Military Post. Yes. Yes. Would, would you repeat that once again? Please. Uh, Helen. Helen. Let me alone. I don't want to talk to anyone. Uh, Please. Please go away and let me alone. Helen, it's me. It's Marge. Marge? Marge? You heard that? Yes, just now. How about Bill? How about the plane? It's not just another room. No, Helen, no. They found the plane near the Swiss border on the side of a mountain, and, and they found the plane, and, and Helen, they think everyone's all right. When they flew over, they, they could see the people waving near the wreckage of the plane. Marge, he's alive. He's alive. Attention. At ease, girls. 
Is everyone here, Betty? Everyone, ma'am, uh, with the exception of Helen. She went out to Rhine, Maine about an hour ago. Well, that's understandable. Uh, please, all of you sit down. I just wanted to thank you all personally for your help during the recent emergency. All of you collectively, and particularly Corporal Marge Millen. Our job here in Frankfurt, in fact, the job of the Women's Army Corps all over the world, is one about which very few people know. Too few people. We are not in active combat, but we have important battle lines which must be held, no matter how difficult the circumstances. They must be held. Corporal Millen has demonstrated this very ably these last few days. Her untiring efforts, the long hours she spent at the switchboard, all this should be an example of the spirit of WAC to all of you. Now, there are no medals given out for courage, such as she has showed, but medals aren't necessary. She had a job to do, and she did it well. We all owe her a vote of thanks for proving the qualities of the Women's Army Corps. When you get finished taking bows, Marge, how about some coffee? <laughs> uh, sugar, please. And sure, I know. And no cream. <laughs> a message for you young women who have just graduated from high school. There's a future for you in Air Force Blue. Yes, an important future in the exciting places of the world. Today, the WAF, Women in the Air Force, is rapidly expanding to keep pace with our defense needs. Now, if you are between the ages of 18 and 34 and can qualify, enlist in the WAF women in the Air Force, and join the many patriotic American women who are serving their country on the Air Force team. You are needed to fill an important job in the service of your country. So visit your United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station. Have a talk with the recruiting sergeant and learn all of the facts. Remember, there's a future for you in Air Force Blue. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station by the United States Army and United States Air Force Recruiting Service. This program featured a cast of outstanding players. This is Kenneth Banghart speaking and inviting you to tune in this same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail.